Hey, what's up guys, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna be looking at change management. Change management, while sometimes a frustrating control, is vital when it comes to maintaining the security and the stability of our systems. Now, I have personally seen the problems that changes can have on systems when not properly tested or scheduled. For example, once I was working on a customer's firewall when I noticed the clock was wrong. So I thought to myself, well, I'm here, I might as well change it. After all, I wouldn't want the logs to have the wrong timestamp, would I? So I changed it. Then I lost connection to the firewall and the entire office lost their internet connection. And that was because the firewall rebooted. And after several very anxious minutes, thankfully the firewall came back up, which was lucky because there was absolutely no IT staff on site at that time. Now, fortunately, this was a relatively small company that was affected. But for large enterprises, even small changes like this can affect thousands of devices if you're not careful. This is where change management comes in. Now, if there was a change management process in place, and if I had followed it, then this would have never have happened. So then, what is change management? It's an official process that details various information and the steps to take when making changes to a system within a business. The goal of the change management process is to avoid things like misconfigurations, which could cause systems to stop working properly, security issues being introduced either directly or indirectly due to the change, or downtime and outages due to some silly person rebooting a firewall and taking down the internet. So the type of changes that can cause these are things like applying operating system or application patches, configuring new or existing networking equipment, installing new software on critical systems, and the list goes on and on and on. Pretty much any change can pose a risk. Okay, so what is actually included in a change management policy? Impact analysis. Any change to a live environment can have significant impact on the ongoing operations. It is essential to carefully consider the potential effects that you could have on productivity, system performance, and the overall user experience. Testing plans. Before making any changes to live production environments, changes should be tested on a lab or a test system. Backout plans. Additionally, a change management policy typically includes some sort of backout plan. This is a contingency plan to revert changes if something goes wrong during the implementation. Stakeholders. There could also be stakeholders that need to be informed of changes. Now, stakeholders are anyone who could be affected by this change. Identifying and involving stakeholders ensures that everyone who is affected by the change is aware, can add input, and start preparation plans if needed. This helps to identify potential issues and ensures that the change will work as intended without disturbing operations. Approval processes. Typically, there will be a formal approval process when requesting a change. This is to make sure that all the changes are reviewed and authorized by the appropriate people. Maintenance window. Timeframes or maintenance windows for when changes can be made are also very important. For example, it's common to not allow changes to happen on a Friday to avoid problems occurring over the weekend. No one wants to be stuck at work during the weekend due to your bad change. Documentation. Documentation is another key component. Keeping detailed records of all of the changes helps in auditing and tracking to ensure that the change process is transparent and everyone is accountable. Right, let's dive into some of these in more detail. Stakeholders. When you want to make a change to something, one of the first things that you should do is to identify the stakeholders. Now, a stakeholder is someone who has an interest or is directly affected by your project. When it comes to change management, stakeholders may include IT staff, department managers, and executives directly impacted by system changes. For example, when deploying a new customer relationship management, or CRM system, the sales and marketing teams are key stakeholders. By involving the stakeholders early, you can get a better insight to the potential impact that that change could have. You may even get some perspective that you didn't think of before. Ownership. When thinking about stakeholders, it's also a good idea to think about the change owner. In many cases, the change that you are planning to make is carried out by you, yourself, personally. That would make you 
the change owner. However, there are times that the person making the changes will not be you. For example, let's say you're working on a project that needs a firewall rule added. You may be the one requesting the change, but maybe the company has a dedicated networking team who are responsible for the firewalls. In that case, the network engineer who's actually making that change will be the owner of the change and ultimately responsible for it. Impact analysis. One of the first things that we do when thinking about making a change is to think about the impact that it could have. We call this the impact analysis. An impact analysis is performed to understand the potential effects that the proposed change could have on the organization's systems, operations, and its stakeholders. There are a few areas to consider when doing an impact analysis. The technical impact. Assess how the change will affect existing technology including the compatibility with current systems and the potential need for additional resources. For example, updating a firewall rule may improve the security, but it could also affect network performance or stop something else from working entirely. Another technical consideration is the impact it could have on legacy applications or its dependencies. If legacy applications or systems are in place, then any small changes could stop them from working, which could be a disaster for the business. The operational impact. How would the change impact the day-to-day -day operations of the business? For example, introducing a new or an updated CRM system may require training for the sales and the customer services team. This could have a big impact on productivity while everyone is upskilled on the new system. The financial impact. Consider the financial impact, including both the initial costs and the long-term costs or maybe even the long-term savings. For example, introducing some new software may have an upfront cost, but it could lead to better efficiency and productivity, which means savings in the long run. So to conduct your impact analysis, it's a good idea to sit down with the stakeholders and discuss the change and any potential impact that it may bring. Let's talk about the testing plan. Once we have our stakeholders and there are no objections, it's time to think about how we're going to test our change. This is so important when it comes to change management. It ensures that any changes introduced to that production environment doesn't disturb operations or introduce any issues. Identifying issues early. By running tests, we can reveal any unforeseen problems or conflicts, allowing them to be addressed before they impact the live systems. Validating functionality. So ensuring that the changes actually work as intended and meet the requirements without causing any unintended side effects. And assessing performance. Verifying that changes do not degrade system performance and integrate smoothly with the existing components. This is why testing is so important. It's really there to stop you from making a huge mistake, which can be both embarrassing and really, really stressful. Let's talk about the types of testing. The way you carry out your testing is completely dependent on the change you're trying to make. However, there are some testing types to consider. First, unit testing. Unit testing focuses on verifying that the individual component or configuration of the change works correctly on their own. For example, before implementing a new firewall rule to block a specific IP address, unit testing would involve checking that that rule correctly identifies and blocks traffic from that IP address without affecting any other traffic. Then we have integration testing. Integration testing ensures that the different components of the system work together flawlessly after the changes have been made. So let's use our firewall example. After adding the new rule, integration testing would confirm that that rule does not interfere with any existing rules or services, such as VPN connections or web filtering. User acceptance testing. User acceptance testing involves end users checking that the change meets their needs and does not disturb their day-to-day -day activities. For example, having a group of users test access to critical applications and resources after we add our firewall change to make sure that their experience is unaffected. For the testing environment, it's important to have a dedicated testing lab that replicates or is similar to the production setup. It could be a virtual environment or it could be real hardware. This allows for more realistic testing conditions and more accurate results. The backout plan. Once the testing has been completed and whether it has failed or it succeeded, 
it's a good idea to also test the backout plan. The backout plan is the safety net if the worst should happen. It means we can revert the changes made if it causes an issue. Thinking about this beforehand can minimize downtime and allow you to quickly restore systems to their previous state. Now, trust me, you do not want to be thinking about this after you have caused a problem. So how do we do this? How you revert your changes depends on that particular change. It could be as simple as uninstalling an application, editing a configuration file, or modifying a setting. In some cases, it will be more complex and time consuming, like removing updates or full system restores. Either way, backups are going to be your best friend when making changes. The types of backups can range from duplicating the configuration file before you make a change to full system backups that can be used to re-image a server. Trust me when I say when things go wrong and occasionally they will, you'll be happy that you took a backup. In fact, I remember deleting a customer SQL database and for what felt like a very, very long time, I didn't think I could restore it. Luckily, I was able to get it back up but from that day forward, I back up everything before making any types of changes and you should too. Now let's talk about the approval process. The approval process is one of the core components to change management. It ensures that any proposed changes are thoroughly reviewed and authorized before implementation. This process helps to reduce risk, maintain system stability, and ensure that changes will not adversely affect the business. Often the approval process goes through a change advisory board, also known as a CAB. The CAB is a group of stakeholders who meet regularly, say once a week, to review and approve change requests. These stakeholders typically include people from various departments, such as IT, security, and infrastructure ensuring that all perspectives are considered. During CAB meetings, each change is presented by the person requesting it. The proposal should include the stuff we just spoke about. For example, the impact analysis of how the change will affect existing systems and users, details of the testing that has been done to ensure the change works as intended, a contingency plan in case the change does not go as planned, and the time and the date that the proposed change should take place. Then after the request is discussed, a decision will be made to either approve or deny the change. Maintenance windows. Even after the change has been approved, there are still controls that you need to follow, one of which is the maintenance window. Maintenance windows are predefined periods during which changes to systems can be made. These windows are planned to minimize disruption to the business operations. Often, they are time periods when there is low traffic on the network and no important tasks happening. For example, you may want to make a network change in the evening or over the weekend when most of the users are offline. Another great example of a maintenance window is something we call a change freeze. Now a change freeze is when absolutely no changes can be made for a period of time. This is often peak business time for a company or when the most critical tasks are taking place. For example, retailers such as supermarkets will often have change freezes during the Christmas or other holiday periods. This is because a simple update could cause checkouts and payment systems to go down and this could potentially cost them millions per hour. Documentation. Finally, once change control has been approved, implemented, and verified, it's time to start thinking about documentation. Documentation is easily forgotten, but it is an important component of the change management process. By documenting your change, you are helping to keep up-to-date information ready for future use. For example, depending on the change, you may need to update network diagrams. Network diagrams are visual documents that illustrate the network's physical and logical architecture. They display components such as routers, switches, firewalls, servers, and endpoints, along with everything else that is connected. If you were to say, add a firewall, then the company's network diagrams will need to be updated. Another type of documentation that you may need to update is the company's policies and procedures. These document the processes that the staff should follow to carry out particular tasks. Now, if the change you implement 
changes the way the user needs to do something, then the documentation will also need to be updated. Or maybe you're introducing a completely new application or service. In that case, you may need to create brand new policy documents to help users with that new application or that service. The last thing to mention is version control. Version control is a way to keep structured records to track and manage changes to software configurations and documentation. Let me give you an example that I'm sure most of you have done before. Let's say you create a document, but we want to make a change. So we go ahead and we make our change, but instead of overwriting the existing document, we add something like v2 to the end of the name. If we make another change, we might add v3 to the end of the name. This is version control. We are updating a file, but also keeping our different versions just in case we need to go back. I sometimes do this for these video scripts and the same concept can be used for all sorts of changes from software configuration files, backups and more. In fact, my video editor even does this for different revisions. By maintaining detailed records of each version, organizations can make sure they are tracking changes, holding accountability for the person making the change and have the ability to roll back if needed. This video is part of our Security Plus in 31 Days course. If you like this video, you are gonna love the full course. Not only does it cover each exam topic in simple and easy to understand videos, but it also provides hands-on labs. These labs guide you through practical tasks like creating Trojans, cracking passwords, and sending your own phishing emails, giving you real-world experience and making your studies that much more engaging and effective. It doesn't stop there though. You also get a copy of our Security Plus in 31 Days ebook, which follows the course and covers each topic. You'll also get access to helpful downloads to support your learning, a private community where you can connect with fellow learners and exclusive discounts. It really is the complete package to guide you through your Security Plus journey. Check it out in the description below. Okay, so that is change management. Now this process, while clearly important to the business's stability and security, can sometimes be somewhat time consuming. And when you have a project that needs to get done, it can be a little frustrating as well. So my personal advice to you is, if you have a project that requires any type of change, make sure you check the change controls that are in place way in advance. That way you can avoid any unplanned delays. Right, it's time to test your knowledge with a couple of quiz questions. Question one, after configuring a new firewall rule, your IT team needs to test its effectiveness. Which type of testing should you conduct to ensure the firewall rule is functioning as intended without disrupting existing services? Is it A, load testing? Is it B, unit testing? Is it C, integration testing? Or D, regression testing? The correct answer is, of course, C, integration testing. Integration testing ensures that the new firewall rule functions correctly within the broader network environment and does not interfere with existing services or connections. Now let's look at an exam question from our friends over at Boson using the Exim Max practice exams. Which of the following steps of the change management process is most likely to ensure that no users are performing work on affected systems during an upgrade? A, documentation, B, approval, C, schedule, or D, request? And I'll give you a second to think about it. And I'll go ahead and press the show answer button. And the answer is C, the schedule. And if we scroll down, feel free to pause and take a read of the explanation. Again, that question was from the Boson Exim Max practice exams, which I highly recommend. You can find the link below in the description. And remember, Surpro's premium students with the full course get a nice discount as well. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe. The support from you guys really helps this channel grow. Other than that, thank you for watching.